bags are packed, are you ready to go? This time tomorrow we'll be on the road Riding with you in the sunnier days I wouldn't want it any other way Taking the good with the ups and downs We would go around the earth once every 20 minutes, and we would observe the work two to five. are the launch pads and then the ever popular NASA building over there. We're supposed to head over there soon. Right now we're going to head past the VAB, press site, launch control, and head out to the launch pads. We do have one of the two crawler transporters that move the platforms and the spacecraft to the pad in the VAB. It's getting new engines and hydraulics for that future heavier rocket. We've never taken anything that heavy to the launch pad before. We asked NASA if we could use this uh, on our Explorer tours. If you'd like to come out and take pictures or ask questions, they're revamping it there. They don't have real railings up, but please stay on the concrete, not in the roadway or the parking lot. Oh, cool is this? This is so cool. Everybody's like back there.
here and I'm like, get to the front here. I know. Low mileage uh, Prius, if you would. Hybrid, anyway. Well, the crawler and platforms park now is where we would park the empty crawler after bringing a uh, spacecraft to the launch pad. The crawlers only get about 32 feet per gallon of diesel fuel. So it would save fuel and time getting the empty platform back after a launch. Well, the crawler way goes down almost seven feet, right above the water table. It was sealed. Layers of hydraulic fill, crushed rock, limestone, and a topping of Alabama River rock. Under the steel treads and all that weight, it crushes to dust to help smooth the ride out so we don't rattle the spacecraft. The road grader then comes along to turn the rock over. It's got a piece of chain link fence dragging behind to smooth it. You don't have to get fancy. And we use Alabama rock because unlike most rocks, if you hit it or crack it or bang it, it'll never shower any sparks. You don't want sparks with solid boosters above you. When we make the bend up here, we'll actually be going over the headwaters of the Banana River that separates Merritt Island from Cape Canaveral. You'll get another view of those launch pads down the coast and as we retire the pad. It's being cleaned up and should be put on display with Atlantis later in the year. The vehicle is over the treads, those four gray columns on the corners. They're hydraulic lifts. Looking like this, a crawler can drive under a platform on pylons, raise up about six feet or two meters to pick it up and move it wherever it needs to go on pylons at the pad and the VAB. Well, SpaceX is not going to be using the pylon system at Pad A. They actually had them removed. They've been sitting there since Apollo, and they're all gathered together here up ahead of us on the left. And I really want to leave time for plenty of discussion, questions and answers, if I can answer questions. <laughs> um, so. Primarily, I am a scientist. Uh, I applied uh, to NASA just before I graduated from college uh, to become uh, to, to the uh, first astronaut selection in 1978. Um, they sent me back a nice short letter saying, contact us again when you're qualified, because I hadn't graduated by that time. The, uh, I graduated in 1980. The space shuttle flew the first time in 1981, remember? Um, one of the opportunities I had was to, to go to Johns Hopkins University to help build a one meter diameter telescope that was going to be a part of a space shuttle project. It turned out that it was a, a large project known as the Astro Missions, plural, in ultraviolet astronomy. NASA had selected three telescopes. The one that I was uh, went to work on, the Hopkins Ultraviolet Telescope, Another telescope called the UIT, everything has to have an acronym to be part of NASA, right? So, UIT stood for the Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope. And lastly, um, a telescope that won a bottle of Jack Daniels for coming up with the best acronym. It was called the Wisconsin Ultraviolet Photopolarimeter Experiment, otherwise known as Whoopi. <laughs> and uh, the, they were, the three of these uh, telescopes were designed to uh, integrate completely into the operations of the shuttle. So it's unlike the Hubble Space Telescope or Chandra which came along later, the Astro missions used the shuttle itself as part of the observatory. Um, they used the power system for the shuttle, they used the data handling system, they used the shuttle as a stable platform, um, and it was, because of that, it was also operated from the flight deck of the shuttle. And NASA decided also that they would select members from the teams that helped to build the, the observatory um, to hire as the astronauts to operate it whenever it was in orbit. It just made sense to have somebody operating it that knew a lot about it. And so I was selected as, as, as one of three payload specialists to operate this observatory whenever it was in orbit. Originally there were three flights planned and they were planning three more. So it just you know, it made perfect sense to do that. Of course I was all for it. <laughs> I volunteered and was selected as one of the three. Um, we began to train, uh, moved to Houston, became part of the astronaut corps. 
Um, we continued the development of the observatory throughout all of our training, because that was our primary job in orbit, was to operate the observatory. Um, we started building the telescope in 1980. We finished it at the end of 1984. It took a little over four years to build. And we delivered it to Florida in January of 1985, where it met up with the other two telescopes that made up the observatory. Um, it took a year to integrate the three telescopes together with all of the rest of the hardware and uh, attach it in the Space Shuttle Columbia, run tests to make sure everything was functioning properly. We were uh, trained and ready to go. Uh, the telescopes were in the cargo bay of Space Shuttle Columbia, sitting in the orbit processing facility. We were just waiting for the next flight to get off the ground so that we could roll Columbia out to the launch pad and launch. But it turned out that was the Challenger accident. So we were on deck waiting for the Challenger to fly. Um, that didn't happen, and uh, so there was a, a, a long wait. It was about two and a half years to get the shuttle system fixed. There was then a recertification flight. That was that this, the only objective of that flight was to test all of the changes that had been made to the shuttle system. There were also some high priority Department of Defense flights that had been waiting in the early days of the shuttle program. Uh, the Department of Defense was, Defense was using the shuttle to carry its national, what we call national assets, spy satellites, into orbit. And they had no other way to get them into orbit at the time. And so they were very high priority, certainly higher priority than just a pure science mission. Uh, there were three of them, and so they had to fly those. Uh, then we had some problems with the payload, and just, we just kept moving down the manifest. Um, we were finally ready to fly in the spring of 1990. Um, we still went through a series of delays. Um, where we had, uh, when you fill the big external tank with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, you actually fill that through the engine manifolds in the shuttle. So it comes from a big tank sitting on the outside of the launch pad. Launch pad. There are lines that bring it to the launch pad. It moves up through the launch pad, through the engines themselves. So it actually flows through the engine and into the tank. And when that happened, it leaked hydrogen gas all inside the engine compartment. So the, the manifolds themselves, the engine manifolds, had leaks in it. And it took quite a while to get that fixed, and we went through a series of delays where we would come down and get ready to fly. They would start the tank process and leak, and so we'd have to go back to Houston. And we, we did that five times altogether. Um, and they would try to fix it on the launch pad, and we'd come down and, and run another test to see if it would, if we could fly, and no, nope, we had to go back to Houston. Finally, they decided they had to roll it back into the vehicle assembly building to fix it. So they rolled Columbia back into the vehicle assembly building. They rolled another shuttle launch, uh, Atlantis out and launched it while we were waiting. They finally got it fixed and rolled it back out to the launch pad. But this is Florida, right? There was a hurricane there coming, and so they had to roll it back into the vehicle assembly building, wait for the hurricane to pass, and then roll it back out to the vehicle. So it took us uh, six months from the time we started trying to launch until we finally launched. We finally did launch on Columbia. Um, we were in orbit for nine days, operating the observatory. And astronomy happens really fast in orbit. You go around once every, Earth once every 90 minutes. So stars rise and set in about 30 or 45 minutes. And in orbit, you can observe during the daytime portion of the orbit. Because even though it's very bright below you, you look out away from the Earth and it's pitch black. You can see the stars. And you can certainly operate the telescopes in the daytime. So we would go around the Earth once every 90 minutes, and we could observe anywhere from two to five different objects during one orbit. So we, it was you know, happened really fast. We um, we landed out in California after nine days in orbit. We ferried Columbia back to Florida. We took the telescopes out of the out of Columbia, took them apart completely apart, and recoded all the optics, put them back together process that took two years to do, um, but uh, there have been some significant improvements in the coding technology for ultraviolet optics, so it made sense for us to do that. We did that. Um, we installed it in the Space Shuttle Endeavor, launched again in March of 1995, and this time operated the observatory in orbit for 17 days, which was the longest individual flight of the shuttle program. We landed again out in California, it's just an amazing adventure. Um, if we could look at this video, there's a video, I hope you can see the screen here, okay. Um, 
This is kind of a collage of the two flights that I was on. So that's me and Wendy Lawrence. Um, this is the, the crew of SPS 67, the second flight that I was on. We're having what is a traditional breakfast in crew quarters here at Kennedy Space Center just before we go out to the launch pad. I don't know why it's breakfast. It's always breakfast. It's about 8 at night. We were at late night launch. We go from there down to the soup room, put on our launch and entry suits. We run some pressure checks to make sure that they're got low pressure. Walk out of crew quarters and get the van to drive us out to the launch pad. Drop us off at the base, we get in an elevator, go up to that level, where it's 195 feet up. There's a closeout crew there that helps you get strapped in, it takes about an hour. They leave. We sit there for about another hour and a half as the test team is going through getting all of the, all of the systems up and running and making sure everything is ready. Four minutes before liftoff, you start the hydraulic system on the shuttle and maneuver all the flex surfaces to make sure they're ready before you commit to a launch. This is the launch ignition sequence. You first ignite the three main engines on the shuttle and bring up the full power while you're still bolted to the launch pad. Two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour on the voyage to view the universe. So when you get the zero in the count, you ignite the two solid rocket boosters fire shape charges and split the nuts and have the release it from the launch pad. First two minutes while well, the solid rocket boosters are burning, uh, the ride is pretty rough. A lot of very, very large amplitude jerky movement in all three directions. Power flight is eight and a half minutes. Once that's done, then you're in orbit. And you're going to stay there until you fire the motor and do radio engines several days later. As soon as the main engine's cut off, you go right to work. Open the payload bay doors, start activating the telescopes. That's Tammy Jernigan and myself in the Space Shuttle Endeavor. In the Asplite deck, we were, that's what we were doing, operating. Uh, Activating the telescope, getting them ready to start making the observations. And that's me in the Afrobeck of Columbia. That's, uh, all around me there are the controls for the telescopes. Here I am teaching a physics class from Orbit, using specially selected middle schools around the country. Jeff part of class too, but he's all along with Ty, so he can <laughs> upstage me. <laughs> the only tie in space. There, I think. So these are the bunks or sleep stations where the, the off-duty crew can sleep and sort of shut out the noise and light from the, the crew that's working. So we get up and go to work every day in order.
<laughs> We've been trying to keep it floating between us and it would drift away and finally we just gave up and blew it up. Sunnier day. 